A very warm welcome to everyone. <clears throat> I'm Kath White, who's the, and I'm now the ex-chair of the GA, Tiny Mia branch. I'm, I'm representing Brenda Turnbull, who's the chair tonight. Before we get started, a quick reminder that everybody's welcome to attend our events, whether you're a GA member or not. They are free, although donations are welcome, and we encourage you to join the GA. We are keen to hear from you about topics that you'd find useful in our lecture series. You can see the contact details, the emails on the slide. So get in touch with any of the three and send us your requests as well as your comments, please. A reminder to check out the GA's Geography Education Online or GEO website. It's very useful to those of you in years 12 and 13, especially if you're catching up on material mixed during, which you missed during the lockdown. The, GO, the GA's materials and services are of excellent quality and cheaper if you are a GA member. I just want to give a few words about today's talk and the chat function. It's nice for speakers to have an audience rather than talking into the void of cyberspace. So please keep your camera on if you have one and you feel comfortable in doing so. If you have a question, you can pop it in the chat and I'll compile the questions for the question and answer session at the end. And during that session, you can also use the raise hand function. And when I ask, you to tell me your question. Please unmute your microphone. If you can give us your full name and email address, we can send you a certificate of attendance for the talk. This includes all the names of your watching as a group, please. Certificates are very useful for the UCAS personal statements, school prizes, and parents love to see them. You can do this applying for a certificate either in the, in the chat or via Louisa's email, which is on the screen now. So I would like to introduce to you today, Glyn Roberts. I've known Glyn since we both study for a geography degree at Liverpool University. After completing a postgraduate planning course in Nottingham, Glynn joined a local authority planning department, eventually gaining the necessary experience to become a chartered town planner. Glynn became chief planner for the Central Manchester Urban Development Corporation in 1989. He held that role throughout the life of the UDC until 1996 working on the planning strategy for the corporation's regeneration of the rundown southern half of Manchester city centre. Key regeneration project initiatives included the development of Manchester's conference, exhibition and cultural quarter, the regeneration of the historic Castlefield Canal Basin for housing and leisure, the redevelopment of Piccadilly Station as an integrated transport hub, hub, the Metrolink tram system through the city centre, and the completion of Manchester city centre ring road and the Manchester airport second runway. Glynn then worked as a director of the North, North Liverpool Partnership Regeneration Programme dealing with a broad programme of community, social, economic and housing regeneration in the northern part of Liverpool, where the community of 27,000 was one of the most deprived areas in Western Europe. Following the North Liverpool job, Glynn became a regional director of an international technical consultancy where he advised a range of public and private sector clients. His work included programs such as the large housing market renewal and 
and investment programs for Birmingham, Hull and North Staffordshire funded by the government, local authorities and, and private developers. Glynn eventually returned to the public sector for five years as development director for the North Staffordshire Regeneration Partnership and the city of Stoke-on-Trent. In 2009, Glynn was <clears throat> appointed by the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government as one of eight full-time members of the new Infrastructure Planning Commission, the IPC, where he helped establish the new national infrastructure planning system for England and Wales. <clears throat> Glynn's talk today is Manchester has regeneration created a sustainable city? And today Glynn's going to talk about whether the approach taken to the city regeneration by all tiers of government and by private sector activity over the last 30 years has guaranteed a, a sustainable future. He will present a case study of Manchester uh, examining the underlying weaknesses and sensitivities in the city's key economic drivers exposed by the COVID pandemic. So without more ado, I'll hand straight over to you, Glenn. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, let me see if I can find out how to share this screen. There we go. Right, um, let's get back to the beginning. Okay, there's an image of Manchester in the gloaming. Um, quite a lot of that image is as the city was maybe at the end of the 19th century uh, or before the Second World War, but actually there is a whole lot of new investment in there as well. And a lot of this has happened in the last 30 years. So, I'm asking the question, um, has that investment, has all that work, all that expenditure uh, led to a city that is robust for the future? Does it have a robust future? And Manchester, I should emphasize, is a, in this case, um, an exemplar. <clears throat> what I'm going to say, some of the issues I'm raising are probably relevant to many of the cities in the UK, perhaps in Europe as well. So what is a sustainable city? Um, obviously, we start with the Brundtland Report definition, the UN report that looked at sustainability. And that defines sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of uh, future generations to meet their own needs. And the three dimensions to sustainability that are commonly recognized are economic sustainability, social sustainability, <coughs> which can include things like health, education, and so on. And environmental sustainability, which most people would recognize as being at the core of sustainability. So um, bearing those points in mind, I would suggest a sustainable city meets the economic, social, and environmental needs of president, present residents businesses and workforce, and that it contributes also to meeting the needs of the wider community in its region, in its country and internationally. Um, because some of these cities are, in fact, world cities, cities like Manchester, historically and now are world cities. They serve a much wider purpose in life than purely for, the, for its own population. And it's important, it's crucial that those needs are met without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own economic, social and environmental needs. And I, as, as I pointed out at the bottom of that note, it's an awfully tall order to do that. So just as a reminder for people in Tyne Weir, uh, <laughs> where Manchester is, um, I've outlined the uh, the very long, thin northwest region down from Cumbria to Cheshire, 
Greater Manchester is a bit closer to the southern end of that and very much part of the corridor of growth that's occurred over the years in what is now described as the M62 corridor. So it's next door to Merseyside. There's green spaces between the two, but really it's, it, it's very close, it's almost a built up urban corridor. And on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see that there are 10 districts within Greater Manchester um, built up historically. The growth started in Manchester, right slap bang in the middle of that uh, picture, that, that image, and um, extended into all of the satellite towns and areas. They're now largely a built up urban area. Um, there are sections of Greenbelt, there are river valleys that run down into Greater Manchester, uh, which divide some of these uh, uh, towns, uh, subsidiary satellite towns, up and uh, separate them out from Manchester, the Manchester Salford core. And uh, in fact, Trafford should be included in that. So, how did we get to where we are? Well, Manchester itself was the first industrial city in the world, um, by which I mean a modern industrial city. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, that, uh, i.e. a city based on industrialized production. Um, there was an explosive growth of cotton textile manufacturing between 1770 and, seven, and 1930, so about 160 years, um, very much based on new technology, on using uh, initially water and subsequently mechanized forms of energy to produce the cotton or to, to process the cotton more accurately. Um, then we had the collapse of the textiles industry and other manufacturing after World War II, um, largely as a result of international competition and globalized production and distribution. So by the end of the 1980s, the economic base was in quite a bad way. Um, we had in Manchester a number of uh, residual functions uh, of the city, city centre retail, a uh, range of offices, including financial and professional services. I think we had a, a branch of the Bank, Bank of England, very small, two men and a dog, as it were. <clears throat> um, and an arts, cultural and entertainment sector. So the city did come to life at the weekends and uh, to a degree in the week, but not to the same extent it is now. But there were very large swathes of the city centre that were semi-derelict, um, huge amounts of vacancy. Um, a lot of the buildings are listed uh, due to their uh, industrial heritage significance. And there are five conservation areas as parts of the city centre. But the historic heart of Manchester is the city centre and there were huge issues there. So the heart of that whole conurbation uh, and, and the inner city surrounding it had huge challenges. Um, those challenges included, or uh, during the 80s, included the centrifugal movement of offices, uh, office-based employment, out-of-town retailing, and so people were moving out into the greenfields of Cheshire, into uh, some of the satellite areas, so into the suburbs, and out of town retail was being developed. So you were seeing an erosion of the functions of the city, if you like, the economic base. And <clears throat> the industrial base was also progressively eroding due to international competition. So you've got a microcosm of what's happening in many of the early industrial cities and urban conurbations in the UK, US and Europe. But um, to set against that negative story uh, is the legacy of Manchester. It's, it, it has been a place of powerful ideas. Um, it has contributed hugely to the development of ideas and thinking that has influenced the development of economy, of the economy of politics, uh, and society really across the world. <clears throat> and uh, as examples of that, and this is not an exhaustive list, by the way, but 
the big ideas that have been heavily influenced by uh, thinkers who have been based in Manchester or have who, or who have um, spent some of their most formative years in Manchester include the uh, the functions of capitalism based on uh, industrial manufacturing and the entrepreneurial spirit that generated that industrial revolution. Um, communism, which is essentially a response and a reaction to um, the movements of capitalism in the early 19th century. Um, Engels, of course, <clears throat> had a role. He was sent by his family from Germany to um, run a, a textile business here in, in Manchester in the Northwest. And uh, with the money he got from that employment, he sponsored Karl Marx to join him in Manchester. And between them, they were uh, instrumental in working up some of the basic principles behind communism. Uh, Marx eventually wrote up in the uh, Communist Manifesto, which is one of the most uh, influential documents um, in world politics. Um, free trade, uh, many of the, the initiatives behind free trade came from the thinking generated by uh, businessmen and politicians operating in, in and out of Manchester. Universal suffrage, and public and environmental health, those uh, housing conditions and the poor health that, accom that uh, accompanied the Industrial Revolution generated in response, uh, thinking about public and environmental health. Um, and also eventually um, led to the establishment of universities, um, which attracted people like Alan Turing, who who uh, contributed enormously to computing and uh, artificial intelligence in the post-war period. <clears throat> right, let's actually um, consider regeneration. Regeneration, uh, by which I mean a government-based interventions in urban fabric, in the economy uh, and in society. And this, these are interventions that are applied to different aspects of a city, of a city's life or in maybe a, a town's life. Um, but normally, and there, there is such a thing as rural regeneration, but the early work on regeneration was uh, really targeted at urban areas. And uh, this, in, in terms of the uh, British interpretation of what urban regeneration is started in England with the 1970s urban programme interventions by Labour government's Ministry of Housing and Local Government under Peter Shaw, Secretary of State at the time, um, that had strong socio-economic components to it. Uh, but in the 1980s, uh, under the Thatcher government, um, Michael Heseltine, Secretary of State in the same department at the time, um, decided that uh, many of his friends in London were having their planning applications turned down by um, uh, what he described as loony left local authorities, uh, inner city, inner urban uh, local authorities. And he wanted to help his friends get their schemes, their development schemes through. He asked his senior civil servants how he could bypass those local authorities and find another way of uh, getting planning permissions dealt with. Uh, one of the senior civil servants suggested that an urban development corporation as used in America might be one way of, um, uh, of doing that. <clears throat> and he, he then said, okay, well, let's have one of those then uh, for inner city London. And uh, the civil servant pointed out to him that if he did that, that would be hybrid legislation, legislation that only applies to one small part of the United Kingdom. Uh, it would go to the back end of the parliamentary uh, legislative queue and he would never, never get parliamentary time to have that decision made, have that get their legislation through. So he said, OK, well, what do we need? What else do we need to do then in order to get it through? Uh, well, well, Minister, uh, you will need to designate more areas. Um, OK, which which is the most 
deprived part of the UK, which, which area would need a, a UDC? Uh, Merseyside Minister. And so that led to the establishment of the London Docklands and Merseyside Urban Development Corporations. So <clears throat> although Heseltine gets in, enormous credit for, um, if you like, being the father of urban regeneration, uh, the, <laughs> the, the actual story is not quite as um, altruistic and uh, I, 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 I can say this with some authority because he, I, he explained this to me um, when I met him down in Parliament once. Anyway, he, he subsequently, uh, he was succeeded by a chap called Nicholas, Nicholas Ridley as um, Secretary of State. And Nicholas Ridley extended the idea of urban development corporations to central Manchester and Trafford Park. So <clears throat> within Greater Manchester, there were two, um, two urban UDCs targeted on the areas that, that were central to the economy of Greater Manchester, Trafford Park being a large, huge industrial estate, um, central Manchester being primarily the southern part of the city centre. Um, and also, obviously, the Tyne and Weir Urban Development Corporation, Teesside and Sheffield UDCs. And there were Apart from the UDCs, Central Manchester um, saw a number of other key regeneration initiatives uh, over that 30 year period. <coughs> I'd say um, amongst the key ones were Salford Keys, the development of the old Docklands um, coming off the Mersey Ship Canal, uh, right in the middle of Salford. That was a local authority initiative. Uh, working with developers, with Peel, who bought the Manchester Ship Canal. Um, in 1993, Manchester made, uh, together with uh, some, some of its sister local authorities, a bid for the 2000 Olympic Games. And uh, there were also, that, that was followed up in 2002 with the Commonwealth Games, um, the IRA bomb, exploded in 1996, um, three months after the UDC folded. Um, and that had, I'll, I'll show you a couple of images of that, but that will get some idea of, uh, of the impact that made on the northern part of the city centre, bearing in mind the UDC had dealt with the southern part. Um, and then some key transport infrastructure was developed. Uh, the Metrolink tram network, I worked on the, the early part of that running through the city centre, but that was extended uh, really across Greater Manchester and is still extending. In fact, there are other lines being proposed at the moment. Um, the inner ring road around the city centre, uh, where I was an expert witness, um, the M60 orbital motorway around the outer part of Greater Manchester, and then Manchester Airport's second runway uh, and I was also uh, an expert witness at the public inquiry for that. <coughs> so apart from the government's in various initiatives or various public uh, initiatives, public sector initiatives, there were key events in the life of the city. The, the UDC wound up in uh, March 1996, and the IRA bombed the northern part of the city centre in June 1996. And you'll see the image on the right, which is Market Street. Um, the building on the right is the Arndale Shopping Centre, and the bridge over there, over, uh, over the, the top end of Beansgate there, um, links to Marks and Spencers. So Marks and Spencers on the opposite side, uh, was equally shattered. And in fact, the, the blast from the bomb ricocheted around that part of the city centre where many of the buildings are <clears throat> seven and eight storeys high. And the blast was contained by the, by the buildings and it blew many of the uh, windows and doors out, not just on the outside of the building, but within the building. So one of our consultants at the time um, had all of their office wrecked, including all their computers, including containing all of their work. And that happened to businesses 
across much of the northern part of the city centre. It was very, very fortunate that the bomb went off um, on a Saturday morning when there weren't more employees working in the city. Um, and it was it's equally miraculous that, that, that uh, really nobody was killed during, during that. This a huge number of injuries, about two or 300 injuries. Um, but, the, but the level of destruction, for, I don't know if anybody ever went to Manchester at that time, so, but it was enormous. On the left, I've shown an image here of the Commonwealth Games, um, the main stadium, the Millennium Stadium, <clears throat> with, this is the opening ceremony. And that was a key development in the development of inner Eastern Manchester. And um, that, that area really was uh, very run down. And the Commonwealth Games was a, a start point for uh, regeneration in that quadrant of the city. But apart from public investment, public sector investment is a very small part of the level of investment that goes into regeneration in cities. <clears throat> and typically, um, when a city receives a, an injection of effort and investment from the public sector, the objective is to stimulate private investments so that the investment becomes self-sustaining and the economy becomes self-sustaining as opposed to being on a downward trajectory. So what I've shown here <coughs> are some of the um, types of development that have taken place in Manchester the sectors of development, if you like, that have been um, uh, targeted by private investors. So the top left-hand side of the, uh, the slide shows blocks of new apartments going up. The bottom left-hand side shows nightclub investments. The middle part of this is the spinning fields development, which is a redevelopment of the um, Manchester courts um, courts complex and adjoining land. So this is publicly or partly publicly owned land, partly privately owned, compl complicated uh, multi-use, uh, mixed-use development, um, where there's a large amount of work done by the private sector. And then we have sports stadia, important sports stadia in Manchester that have been redeveloped, including football stadia. And the bottom right hand corner shows the type of leisure uh, investment in bars, comedy clubs and so on that have taken place. And in this case, adjoining the canal. And I, although you can't, you can't quite see that because of the, uh, the um, you know, these, these little small windows covering it, that, that was developed in railway arches underneath the Metrolink track. So <clears throat> in fact, I, I had quite a lot of involvement with that. Um, so the story um, of regeneration confirms that private investment is key and that cumulative spend of the private investments uh, is much, much greater and usually much, much greater than the public sector inputs. Public sector inputs tend to be there to trigger that investment <clears throat> and, can, and therefore you'll find very much that at the beginning of a regeneration process for a city, um, the ratio of public investment to private investment will be different to uh, the ratio at the end. So for example, when the Central Manchester UDC started to support um, projects with um, what was then city grant, the type of grant that went in to help brownfield developments uh, be viable, uh, typically, the investments were made on the basis of one public sector pound uh, matching uh, three or four uh, private sector pounds of investment. Um, and then by the time that the corporation wound up, uh, that ratio was much more like one to eight or one to nine. You know? And you get once, once you get to that level, 
really some of the developments can proceed without any uh, public support whatsoever. So the thing becomes self-sustaining. <clears throat> and that was very much what the corporation was trying to achieve and largely succeeded in doing. <coughs> um, so ooh, let me just drop back. The, the key sectors that have been targeted, uh, I think I've, I've listed them out there. I've shown you some of the images, um, but you've got things that weren't uh, reflected quite so much in there. I did show you the spinning field scheme. And that, that's got quite a lot in terms of uh, professional services, lawyers and finance, uh, financial companies in there. Um, in the wider city, outside the city centre, you have health and university uh, related technology projects. Um, lots of investment by the universities over that 30 year period and quite a lot in relation to the main hospitals complex in Manchester as well, which is all it's all part of a quadrant that runs out from the city centre <coughs> along Oxford Road. Um, outside the uh, inner area of the city, there are also some key investments. Airport related uh, development has taken place. So wrapping around the main uh, airport runways and uh, complex have been various developments associated with warehousing and distribution and also business parks. Um, so in other words, office developments where the workforce uses uh, the airport a lot um, and you get a great deal of you know, international businesses use locating in, in airport business parks. Um, and I think sports, leisure and entertainment, you've seen examples of, of those uh, investments um, in the previous slides. Uh, retail developments, uh, this is quite an interesting one. <clears throat> the Trafford Centre was built by Peel Developments on land that it owned associated with the uh, Manchester Ship Canal. Um, million square feet, very large scheme. When it's opened up, it, it, it threatened the city centre. And when the bomb went off, the, uh, the northern part of the city centre was largely revitalised and uh, through investment by combination of um, central government investment, uh, local authority investment, investment by the companies themselves and by the insurance industry, because obviously a lot of the, the, uh, the damaged buildings and so on, the, the companies that own the leases, own the buildings were going to their insurance companies and saying, uh, pay out on this. So we, we had combinations of things going on, both in the city center and further out, where there was a, a very strong competition between these different retail centers. <clears throat> um, It'll be very interesting to see what's going to happen to those retail centres in coming years because uh, Traf the Trafford Centre was sold by Peel Developments about, uh, hmm, I'm guessing now, but I think it was about four or five years ago. And they saw that they're, they're quite a far-sighted company and they, they saw that the impact of um, internet retailing was going to really eat into the value of that project and effectively they offloaded it before the impact of internet shopping really started to have its main impact and uh, on the value, the property value and the rentals that they could get. Um, the city centre is, is a different animal to the Trafford Centre, but it, it does compete, they do compete. It'd be interesting to see which of these um, ages best, if I can put it that way, and um, which which centres uh, hold up better in the face of internet shopping? Um, some of the sites that have been developed <clears throat> are owned either by large private companies. So we've got on the left here, Salford Keys, um, where the site was owned as part of the Manchester Ship Canal Company's asset base by Peel Developments who had bought Ship Canal. Um, and on the right hand side, <coughs> you've got uh, developments taking place in East, East Manchester, where there are large areas of land owned by the city council and also by um, manufacturers. 
So you had very large brownfield sites emerging there as the factories closed down. And as housing land was cleared as well through uh, and the old uh, slum clearance days really before the, the regeneration phase we're talking about. Um, so we come to the questions that that process, that historical development and the regeneration process have, have uh, left Manchester with. Um, during looking at the, if you remember the three poles of sustainability, the economy, the social aspects, and the environmental aspects, <clears throat> the economic sustainability issues are manifest really, a lot of them. Uh, I've just picked out a few here, maybe many more. But um, the economy in any uh, mixed economy such as the UK tends to be cyclic, any market economy tends to be cyclic. And a huge amount of the city's rebirth <clears throat> has relied on property-based regeneration. There are pros and cons to reliance on highly cyclic construction where the demand for the product of the construction industry can wax and wane according to the economy, the wider economy. <clears throat> and we're seeing those cycles every seven or 10 years in the UK generally. So there will, every seven or 10 years, <clears throat> there will be a period of years, it could be three years, four years, uh, depending on the depth of the recession or the, uh, in some cases, a potentially a, a depression, um, where the economy of the city will grind to a halt or will stagnate. Um, the development corporation uh, started at the end of a boom in um, the 80s and very quickly within 12 months had run into a serious recession where most things ground to a halt. And, and the pump priming of city grants were very important to get some, and also local investors, rather than national or international investors, were very important in getting um, uh, some key developments underway, which once they had proved, were uh, proven to be successful, attracted people from other cities and places, from other places in the UK and abroad, because something was happening in Manchester that wasn't happening in uh, in other areas <clears throat> so when london was dead things were starting to happen in manchester um service sector employment many many of the new jobs that have been created through the 30-year period have been in sectors such as leisure and entertainment but a high proportion of those jobs are in uh insecure and are uh, minimum wage jobs uh, and therefore, when you see an economic cycle coming through, you know that a significant proportion of those jobs may be affected. Same goes for the professional financial services. Now, those services rely on demand from primary wealth generators, the, the, the big companies and the public sector. <clears throat> those also can be, although they're probably more substantive than the service sector, uh, leisure sector and entertainment sector jobs, Nevertheless, um, they can be unstable in a major recession or depression. So is all of, of this type of investment creating a frothy and insubstantial economy rather than one based on the, the kind of uh, technological innovation and knowledge and drive that created the city in the first place with, with those cotton mills? Um, I think there's a genuine question there, and um, I think this applies not only to, to Manchester, but to places like London. Um, London's, London's focus is very much on financially driven um, services, and we know from what we're seeing with Brexit at the moment that the future is not guaranteed. It's, I mean, it's always been assumed that uh, that was a bedrock. Uh, activity <clears throat> that would you know would be there whatever happened as it were uh, and I think that is a rather uh, that's a blase assumption I think I think it's not guaranteed that those functions of the city 
will remain as they are. They can be subject to policy changes, governmental changes, constitutional changes, as we've seen with Brexit, but also technological changes. <clears throat> Oops, uh, there's one last point there. The impacts of COVID. And I think over the last 12 months, we really have seen um, health issues expose the vulnerability of an economy based on dense concentrations of workers and residents with um, both of those with international links. Uh, the residential population of Manchester comes from, you know, dozens of different countries, um, has links to uh, migration from those countries. And also you've got uh, businesses that operate across boundaries, across national, international boundaries um, and rely on mobility <clears throat> and socioeconomic interaction as well. And really the, the pandemic has really exposed some of the issues that arise from uh, a reliance on health. We, we assume that the population will be healthy. We assume uh, certain types of uh, urban function of social, socioeconomic interaction are going to be workable, viable, and the pandemic has challenged quite a lot of that. Uh, really, earlier on in this presentation, I uh, explained the role that innovation te technology played in the growth, the rapid growth, the explosive growth of the city in the first place. And the emphasis <coughs> on innovation and knowledge um, has led to some uh, projects going ahead. For example, this is Manchester University, the blue buildings on the left there, Manchester buildings, uh, Manchester University's um, proposal for an innovation quarter. Um, and on the right hand side is an innovation building associated with the hospital complex in Manchester, just down the road from the, uh, the university. But these are, you know, relatively small in scale by comparison with some of the initiatives that are going ahead and have been going ahead in other countries. Um, and I would quote uh, technopole type development in France or major uh, investments in, you know, the, the private sector led growth in uh, the Silicon Valley and some of the projects that have been taking place in Japan. And China, of course, has whole builds uh, technical cities uh, on a grand scale. We have in Manchester five universities, um, a huge health complex, including teaching hospitals and medical research centers. And uh, these are the listed there are the key research and knowledge sectors, including advanced manufacturing, creative media, digital and technology, financial professional business services and life sciences and healthcare. I think um, although Manchester plays a role, a significant role in, in all of those, I wouldn't say at the moment Manchester is preeminent in any of them. And I think therefore there are challenges for a city that doesn't have a core uh, area of activity in which it's preeminent worldwide, or even, or at least world, Europe, Europe wide. So there are, that leads on to some questions in my mind. Having said that, the complex of universities and the health complex play a, a huge role in the city. Um, and we have uh, drawn in expertise with those different um, activities, the academic activities and the, and the health activities. They draw on expertise from around the world. And there's a, a flavor of an impression of some of the activities going ahead. So bearing that in mind, um, those points in mind, 
we have some questions and there, there are specific questions here. First of all, the universities, they have demonstrated some vulnerability. They've been hit by the impact of Brexit on staff and student recruitment and research funding. In the short term, they, they're quite hard hit by the impacts of COVID pandemic on the student population in particular. Um, they're crucially dependent on central government funding, which in turn could be affected by the financial implications of COVID and Brexit. Um, the health sector and the major hospitals network, uh, as I've said, the importance of health has been underlined by COVID. Um, there are massive impacts, um, both from COVID's demands on the, on the hospital network and also from the secondary effects, uh, effects of Brexit on recruitment into a health service, which already has key sh shortages in terms of its expertise and staffing and resource. Um, <clears throat> so a big question for education and, and health sectors is, is there enough ambition, focus and effort and funding going into establish a solid foundation for the new knowledge economy? So for example, I showed you that slide with the Manchester University's innovation district. Is that ambitious enough? It does seem to me it's quite small beer by comparison with the international competition. Right, turning from the economy to the social aspects of sustainability, um, cities thrive and on labour. They draw expertise in from the wider world. And the uh, effects of Brexit and tied to UK immigration controls is inevitably going to make that more difficult. It could act as a break on, on growth. Uh, I know universities have made those representations to government, to the Home Office, but th thus far I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not convinced that it's had <laughs> quite as much um, effect on, on the uh, Home Secretary and on the government as uh, universities might like. Um, a slightly different point is uh, the sustainability of the type of housing that's being developed in the city centre. Uh, Manhattan is the current uh, media slang term. Um, is the city selling its soul to developers of luxury apartments? Well, the homeless and poor inner city residents are excluded. Uh, why has there been no significant expansion in social and built to rent housing tenures? There has been some small scale investment in uh, uh, social housing, <coughs> but that's relatively small scale again compared to the level of need. Um, the educational opportunities uh, that are available in Manchester are great. So um, Manchester has in fact, over that 30 year period, expanded enormously by bringing in students from China, from Europe and elsewhere, but has enough focus and effort gone into providing quality secondary and tertiary education for children from poorer communities? Has uh, recent investment benefiting the better off merely defined the exclusion of the poor more sharply? Um, is regeneration to that extent reinforced the city's underclass? Um, and then finally, on the culture, arts, entertainment, and leisure aspect, can Manchester's offer be maintained and improved in the face of the challenges faced by COVID um, and the recession that is following and the public expenditure squeeze that's following? My daughter um, <coughs> is a, a freelancer in the leisure and entertainment uh, area. She's uh, she organizes festivals and um, also arts projects. She uh, produces arts projects. So you can imagine what's happened with her small business. Um, it's, it's, luckily she's, um, she did a degree in business and uh, uh, digital aspects in, in, at Manchester and that's equipped her 
fairly well for adapting her, her activity. But nevertheless, it's had a major effect. And I think <clears throat> that will be stereotypical of a great deal of uh, the impact right across that sector in Manchester and elsewhere in the UK. So a few images. On the left hand side of this slide, you'll see examples of um, members of the community, the inner city communities principally, uh, securing their diplomas, their education certificates from educational projects. And this is what I'm talking about. Is there enough of that type of activity? And on the right hand side, you see cafe culture in Manchester and the box of apartments and converted buildings behind. And then in, in the front, uh, you'll see the street life of Manchester, the people living on the streets. And, and that's a very obvious contrast and stark contrast, the Man Manhattan issue writ large. On the environmental aspect of sustainability, um, Manchester has, I suppose, a, a mixed record. The city's historic growth was very rapid. It was chaos, uh, unplanned growth in the early years. Um, the city pushed out from a, quite a small core in, incredibly rapidly, um, doubling in size every few years. Um, that left a legacy of historic buildings, um, some of them being jerry-built, but interesting for technological reasons. Um, other, other buildings are really of top quality. And Manchester's Town Hall, I think, is a really fantastic building. Alfred Waterhouse design. And the city is aware of its legacy, has been really uh, throughout, and has a good record on historic buildings, conservation and regeneration. Um, when the Urban Development Corporation in the city centre um, was established, uh, we had, when I first arrived, the very first day I arrived in the UDC, um, I was confronted by my chairman and chief exec, who were outraged by objections from English Heritage to a number of uh, proposed um, projects. <clears throat> and um, one of my jobs was very, very quickly to try to resolve the, the tension between uh, historic building conservation and the need to to get them these vacant and derelict buildings reused and uh, so we we had detailed discussions with English Heritage and managed to to um, get a, a very good uh, relationship eventually going with them and I think hopefully that's together with the work done otherwise in other parts of the city by uh, Manchester City Council um, there's a, a good story to tell on the conservation of buildings in the city centre. Poor housing in the inner city um, is being tackled, has been tackled over a lengthy period, uh, but there are very few, and, and in fact, there's still, there's still work to do on that. It's a, that's a never ending uh, challenge um, as buildings age, as the housing ages. Um, there are no major parks in the city centre and relatively few, there were relatively few good public spaces in Manchester compared to other older uh, UK, European and US cities. Um, there have been major efforts over the years. In the 1980s, Greater Manchester County Council developed a River Valleys programme. So all those valleys penetrating into Greater Manchester from the edges, um, were looked at strategically <coughs> and there was a lot of investment by the county council in reclaiming brownfield land in uh, green provision and in public access and the city council and the udc did secure um, investment into city squares into some public spaces in manchester and i'll show you some of those in a minute um, in the wider region around Manchester, there was a Mersey Basin initiative to clean up the rivers and to invest in green access, green space access, put in ranger services, um, build country parks and so on. Um, 
that's had an effect. It's still rather bitty. It's not coherent as or as coherent as it could be. And public transport has been a, a, a move towards public transport from private transport, especially in the city centre. And I think that's going to continue. Air quality, both from transport and industrial air quality, has improved. But uh, I think road, it'd be fair to say that road and air transport pollution is still quite bad and needs transformation in coming years. And the city, conurbation and region are still a huge generator of CO2 and therefore of climate change. So here are some of the public spaces. Um, the Metrolink stop and public space in the north of the city. And these other images are of Castlefield where the UDC invested a lot of money. Um, very pleasant place to go. Combination of listed buildings converted to new uses. Um, pubs, bars, uh, computer offices, new youth hostel, public arena, uh, and generally quite a pleasant place to be, especially on a sunny day. Um, there's the town hall. So the conservation of the old buildings illustrated on the left, Whitworth Street, uh, the old Cottonopolis area of Manchester, where the cotton company offices and warehouses were, mainly converted to residential apartments now. And then on the right hand side, uh, new, a new hotel building, the Hilton Hotel, um, new architecture and uh, apartment blocks. So the con in conclusion, did all this work, all this blood, sweat and money um, lead to a sustainable city? How sustainable is Manchester for the future? Um, well, clearly there's enormous investment and effort by the public and private sectors and private individuals in their own decision making about setting up businesses, buying apartments, uh, doing things positively with their money, if you like. Um, but political will is a key factor. It's not just about money. Uh, political local will, uh, sorry, central and local political will combined with entrepreneurship has changed the city out of all recognition and has stimulated the Northwest region. And I'd say has also contributed to <clears throat> Britain's economic base. Um, there are still big issues and tasks to be addressed. The, the city may look prettier. It may have more activity. It does have more activity. But the big issues and challenges for the future are there, and they are the CO2 regeneration of the city, the, sorry, CO2 generation of the city. How is, how is that going to be challenged? That's a huge issue. There are measures that have been taken by the city, by the local authorities um, and by the mayor, but they are relatively small scale thus far. Uh, the economy, well, we'll discuss the stability of the economy. I think there are real issues about that and far more work on the knowledge and innovation base of the city is needed. Social equity is clearly an issue. Interestingly, the work on COVID has highlighted that things can be done to get the homeless um, people uh, really from the streets. And work can be done also to support inner city communities. So it's about political will. It's about putting the effort and the money into the right quarters. And then finally, um, I would suggest that the linkages to the wider network of northern urban centres uh, is going to be critical, not just the creation of a fast rail link to London. Thank you very much. That concludes my presentation. And I'll hand over for questions and any discussion. Thank you. Yes, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much, Glyndor. Really fascinating, interesting talk. Um, We'll go to the question and answer sessions if, if you'd like to put any questions into the chat. Um, but whilst I'm giving people time to do that, um, 
Bill, would you like to ask your questions of Clint? Yeah, hi, Glenn. We're normally playing guitars rather than asking <laughs> questions at these things. Yeah. So I enjoyed that very much. Thanks very much indeed. Um, as you know, I, I've been in Manchester and Salford for many, many years, and I guess people who live in Salford may have a slightly different view of, of um, the origins of, of um, Manchester and Salford in, in a way. But the question, the two questions really, one was about consultation, you know, I mean, if you, if you look back over the decades, um, town planning and urban redevelopment has had, um, um, it's had a, a, a slightly shaky past at times because, um, you know, that the, the, the slums were cleared and people were rehoused, but they were put into these horrendous tower blocks in Hume and elsewhere. And these, these went downhill very, very quickly. Over a period of 10, 12 years, they were unlivable in and people had the double whammy of not having any, they were all isolated. So um, the, the question is about consultation, you know, very often people would accuse planners of doing what they think people want rather than getting the people's ideas in the first place of what they really want. Yes, I think that that's one of the perennial critiques of planning. And I think it's fair to say there's a tension there because Planners can only work within the art of the possible. Um, uh, sometimes uh, there are aspirations that are very difficult to meet. But on the other hand, I think you would find um, that the Hume was redeveloped far more recently. Uh, the, the difficult housing you're talking about, the Crescents and so on were removed, much to the dismay of the 1960s society. Um, <laughs> Well, but, the concrete society, yeah. yeah. But the um, the work that was done there did involve a large amounts of consultation of, of the community. Um, but in fact, if you look at Hume now, the people living in, in the housing there, parts, parts of that community, because the community had run down significantly, mm -hmm. the residential population of Hume, uh, had you had you said okay let's just have enough housing to 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 occupy or to to accommodate those that population the Hume would would have been a fraction of the size it is now mm -hmm. it, it's actually accommodated a much larger population so consulting the people who were there at the time when the Hume presence came down wouldn't necessarily have if you like involved or engaged the people who now live in Hume necessarily or all of the people that now live in Hume so there are, it, it is possible to run good and effective community engagement. Um, it's not possible to keep all of the people happy all of the time or to satisfy everybody. Um, but I think planners and planning uh, generally are far more sensitive and aware than in the days of slum clearance and, you know, when before consultation was brought into the legislation and into the training of planners in the way it has been. Okay, can I just quickly get my second one in and, and then I'll shut up. The, um, you can guess what my question probably will be and that is um, you define the, um, the, the, the pillars that you would um, design a redevelopment plan around as being economic, social and environmental. Um, and I was just wondering why health wasn't in there, you know, Greater Manchester has some of the worst health metrics in the country. Um, and um, really, it, 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 how planning impacts on health should, from my opinion anyway, should be central to any, any design really, in terms of the way we go forward. The, the reason I refer to those three um, dimensions are those are the those are dimensions that were identified in the Brunton report as the basis for sustainability, and I think you'll find if you look at that report and sub what the subsequent work that's been done by bodies like the United Nations and and um, uh, even the UK government now and certainly the European European Commission, health will be 
regarded as a component of of the social aspects. In fact, I'm sure it would penetrate into other dimensions as well. Certainly, it interacts heavily with environment. Mm -hmm. I think, it, in, you know, as you've heard from my presentation, I think it interacts a lot with the economy of the city. Um, mm -hmm. that, that the health complex in Manchester plays a hell of a role in in the economy of the city. Yeah, so well, I, I, I think it's very difficult to sort of isolate health from the other aspects. Mm, but I was thinking, I was thinking about keeping more about keeping people well, really, in a way. I mean, ironically, um, the, the motto of Salford City um, is is a line from Cicero, which um, is "Salus populi suprema lex esto," which translates as "The health of the people should be supreme." Mm -hmm. So um, I think you probably got that one right, really. Well, I think probably that would be a, a more telling phrase post. <laughs> pandemic wouldn't it for you know, yeah. strike, strike a chord with our current government <laughs> thanks thanks very much thank you bill for your questions um paul would you like to give glenn your, your question hi glenn uh thanks for that i really enjoyed it um fascinating insight to to regeneration manchester star but i suppose it's what's in the name city of manchester greater manchester um, combined mayoral authority, metropolitan area. And it's really, um, given all your experience over the decades, um, just a, a, some thoughts around the right scale at which to make plans and strategies. Um, just because, um, as you know, when you plan things at a local level, um, you can end up displacing and competing. And sometimes um, it's not always that big is beautiful. Can, so maybe too big is, is not as beautiful as it, we'd like it to be. I'd just be interested in your thoughts on that, please. Um, planning as an activity has to take place at every scale, really, from the national, and in fact, international. You're, you're looking at, at the European Commission, for example, it operates at an international level across national borders. <clears throat> so, for example, it's... it's uh, its transport network is organized across the whole of Europe. So that there are certain aspects that lend themselves to um, being planned to a degree at each of those scales. And it very much depends on, uh, I think the principle of subsidiarity should apply. So for example, central government recognized that it couldn't deal with inner city areas like, um, Manchester or uh, 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 at the at the national level, it had to um, pick out specific target to to deal with, and where there were identified uh, opportunities as well. In fact, what what they did with the UDCs, uh, I'm not saying this is this is the criteria they're using for all investment types, but they they were basically spotting opportunities places where they thought that if, um, a bit of pump priming could attract uh, private investment to generate a, a bigger impact. And um, although I am not a great sympathiser of um, conservative politics, I, I do think they got it right on, on that occasion because the, the impact of, of UDCs in Tyne and Weir and in Manchester both the Trafford Park UDC and uh, Central Manchester was very positive in, in achieving that, that sort of objective. And it triggered other activity by local authorities. Uh, certainly Manchester, my experience of Manchester when I first arrived there was that it was staffed with highly intelligent people, but driven by um, a lot of uh, inter nissan faction fighting within the Labour Party, which tend to absorb enormous amount of energy. So the city tended to look in on itself. And it was the engagement of the city in, in wider things that started to change that. So the things like the Olympic bid, Commonwealth Games, that did actually, they suddenly realised that Manchester was in a competition with other places. And that influenced so, and I think that, um, so in a way that was approaching it from the bottom up and, and moving towards a more strategic vision of Manchester. Um, 
and the government was approaching it the other way. It was looking at micro opportunities, um, trying to pick out, pick winners, as it were, cherry pick from a national perspective. I do think we have a government at the moment that, that misses the opportunity, that sees strategic planning as a threat more than, a, more than a, an opportunity in that um, it's reluctant to devolve power to um, mayoral bodies at, at the sub-regional level. Um, it, it, it has devolved some powers, but they're quite constrained and very limited. And I, I think there is there's more opportunity there, and they could they could get far more happening in the UK, certainly in England, um, if they if they trusted people more at the local level. Um, I think the sub regional level has been underplayed and it's been messed about with as well uh, since the bodies like the uh, Greater Manchester County Council were were abolished. Uh, um, historically, Labour have had more faith in um, metropolitan counties, in sub-regions, in regional planning, and the Conservatives have tended to um, have less faith and want to scrap those bodies. It may be down to where the political control lies uh, in metropolitan areas and so on. But I think we're at a stage now where in order to get um, the country going and moving out of a, a difficult recessionary period, there's going to have, be, have to be some serious thought given to sub-regional and regional levels, as well as to the micro level. And there may be a case for, I mean, at the moment, there are no major urban development corporation programs or um, it, I, I think to some extent the case has been weakened by the fact that local authorities have have borrowed the clothes, as it were, of the UDCs. They, they mainly have uh, regeneration sections. They have activities. They've got a strong strand to the, to the <clears throat> focus of their leadership and uh, both at officer and political levels. Um, and they've got dialogues going with the um, the, the relevant government departments that can provide funding for the types of projects they're involved in. And they work with, with um, major investors in a much more positive way than was happening when the UDCs were initially uh, started. But that micro level work, the local level work that has been important to the creation of, uh, if you like, modern Manchester and in fact, the model, the modern Newcastle um, and other cities in the North and Midlands <coughs> um, depends and still depends on central government having some sort of feel for what's going on in a region. And there does seem to me to be a gap. They don't have regional offices anymore. Um, there is some talk about devolving treasury to uh, uh, foreign parts as far as a uh, uh, London-based civil services concern. Um, but there's still an enormous gap between what happens in the centre, in the bub Westminster bubble, and what happens down on the ground. Um, I think the, mayor the mayoralty for Greater Manchester has proved to be a good thing. Um, the City Council, certainly in Manchester, is very active, and I think a number of the other local authorities are. So that you've got a um, patchwork quilt of arrangements at the moment, rather than any one solution, one, uh, uh, you know, there's no coherent tiered approach to those, those many tiers of planning. Um, I mean, you could argue that many, many, let many flowers bloom and see what works. Um, but it, it would be, I think, helpful to move over time towards a more coherent set of arrangements which provide for those different levels of planning and divide up the key roles in a more meaningful and rational way than we have at the moment. Good. Charlotte, would you like to ask your question? Is she not here? No, Charlotte asked, 
Mm. Did you think the city centre shops are more sustainable than the Trafford centre? And what do you think would happen to the other one if they collapsed? Mm. I think um, out of town retailing is having a rather difficult time of it. Um, I think town centres and city centres are also having a difficult time of it. Uh, it uh, my, the question in my mind is, which has the longer term future? As the, um, as the centres age, who is going to invest in an out of town shopping centre? Mm. As a, has a, you know, the metro centre in uh, Newcastle or the Trafford centre, <clears throat> do they have the, they are large concrete boxes set in car parks. Do they have the, in, the quality of the environment and that they are built for a single purpose? How easy are, will those buildings be to adapt to new purposes? Um, the, the city centres are much more diverse, they're more granular, there's more variety, there's more opportunity to do different things with those buildings. There's more character there as well. They're more attractive to visit. So I'm thinking <clears throat> there may be more opportunities for a city centre or for certain city centres than there, there will be for out of town boxes. But who knows? I think we that, re that really is a, a major question for the future. And I also think it will depend on government policy in the light of um, the climate change agenda, uh, you know, is the government going to be encouraging carbon um, retail over city centres? I'm not sure. I don't think it will. Good. Thank you, Glenn. Is there are there any more questions that anybody would like to ask? Mm -hmm. Well. It just remains for me to thank you very much indeed, Glyn, for a really stimulating thought and thank you all for your interesting questions as well. Please don't forget if you need a certificate of attendance to write to Louise and her email is, is there. Next week is our last um, talk for this academic year, which will be John Smith talking about um, year 12 fieldwork and different strategies for it but as it says here we are preparing for the next academic year i am helping the branch to find people who would like to talk uh, so if you have any ideas of what you would like to talk on or if you would like to volunteer to talk i would be very interested to hear from you and if you just write to, to brenda here she'll pass the email on but thank you very much for your attendance today. Kath, can I just uh, can can I just cool. suggest if if anybody's interested in um, any academic books, if they wish to uh, undertake any work on Manchester, I've got some um, books that people may find interesting to do with the development of Manchester, to do with particular types of buildings, uh, the history of urban regeneration, and so on. And just picking up on, on Charlotte's um, question, Paul's put into the chat um, an interesting website about what's happening with retail parks at the moment, if, if you'd like to, to click on that before you leave this talk. But thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.